Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. We talked last week about the devil's toolbox. We're in a, definitely in a spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle, and our enemy is real. Our enemy is the devil. The Bible describes him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy us, and he has various tools and means and methods by which he is able to affect us and cause us to be lost. He can't force us to be lost. We have to give him our consent, but he has tools that he can use to influence us. And so the devil has a toolbox, but thanks be to God that as we've sung this morning, the battle belongs to the Lord. The devil has already been defeated by God, and God has not left us without sufficient tools, more than sufficient tools that we may be able to use in our battle with the devil. And those tools, as we're going to see this morning, are the armor of God that is described for us in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. I'm not going to reread those passages, but what we're going to do is notice again that Paul does make it very clear that we're in a spiritual warfare. And as such, God has given us weapons, or we could say tools to use in that battle that we are engaging in with the devil. And so as we think about the armor of God this morning, we're going to look at the different uh, parts of that armor and ask ourselves, how does this armor help me in my battle against the devil? Because if I allow the devil to win, that means that ultimately I've lost my soul. And that is my most valuable possession. So let's think about a little bit this armor that God has given us, the tools at our disposal that are more than sufficient to help us to inherit eternal life. Paul in uh, verse 14 starts off by mentioning the girdle of truth. He says, there, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. It's interesting that he starts with truth before everything else. And it's as I was preparing this, truth and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, they're sort of synonymous because the sword of the, the word of God is truth, but the idea of truth itself is a little more broad than God's word. There is truth apart from God's word as well. But he mentions truth first, and it is true that without truth, we couldn't even begin to stand against the devil. Truth is absolutely fundamental in our battle against Satan. We have to have it. We have to possess it in order to be able to fight the devil. And Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And so if we want to get to the Father, which is what the devil is trying to stop us from doing, we have to do it through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. In John 1 and verse 14, the Apostle John, in writing this uh, gospel account, describes Jesus as the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Notice, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of both grace and truth. And Jesus imparted that truth to us in, so that we might use it in our battle against the devil. Of course, God's word is the embodiment of spiritual truth, we can say. In John 17 and 17, in his prayer to the Father, Jesus said to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And again, so there is some overlap here between uh, the girdle of truth and the sword of the Spirit, because the sword of the Spirit is truth, and it is what we use in our battle against the devil. Jesus promises his disciples that the truth can set us free. Not free in the sense of free from physical bondage, but rather free from the bondage of sin that afflicts every single one of us. 
In John 8, 31 and 32, he tells his disciples, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It can free us from the guilt, from the consequences of sin, if we know and obey the truth. We need to remember that one of the devil's tactics, which we didn't talk a whole lot about last week, but one of the devil's tactics is to sow discord through false teachers. Now we said division is one of his tools that he uses, and he uses false teachers many times to sow that division among the followers of God. And it takes truth to fight that. Truth is the ultimate uh, cure for division. Now, we look at the division that exists in the religious world and we wish that it was not there. What is the remedy for that? Well, truth. We've got to go back to the Word of God and, and discover what it teaches and obey it. And if we can do that, then we would have the type of unity that God desires. But the devil will use uh, false teachers, so again, there's a need for truth so that we may be able to combat those false teachers. We need to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 where it says when Paul came to them and began to teach, it says that they received the word with all readiness. They had open minds and were willing to listen and search the scriptures daily. Exactly the right thing that they were to do when a spiritual teacher comes into town, when a teacher comes into the church building, whatever it might be, go to the word of God. And confirm that what they are teaching, what they are saying, is in accordance with what the scriptures teach. So they search the scripture daily to find out whether these things were so. And let us be like that and understand the value of truth that we have. And how important it is in our battle against the devil. We're told in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 by Peter, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give uh, a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to be ready to give a defense of the gospel to those who ask reason of the hope that is in us. Now, again, as I often point out when we talk about this passage, that doesn't mean I need to know the answer to every little nitpicky type of detailed question that somebody may ask me, but... I need to be, be able to give a defense of why I believe what I believe. And I should be able to convey that, and I should do that with meekness and fear. And so truth is what, what allows us to give an answer. And we need it so badly in our battle with the devil. Because uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, where he's talking about the early church and, and how God was... Uh, growing the church into what he wanted it to be, and that he gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice, till we all come to the unity of the faith. That's, I believe, talking about the time when we had God's completed word, which at the time he wrote this, it wasn't completed yet. And, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, notice that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is head, Christ. We use the truth because without it, we would be tossed about to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. There are false teachers out there, and the devil uses those false teachers to lead good people away from the truth. We need to confirm everything that we're taught by the word of God, by truth. We need to learn to discern both good and evil. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 5, he actually rebukes his audience to whom he is writing because... They had come to a point where they should have known truth. They should have been more mature in their knowledge of God's word, but they weren't. And he says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Then you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see, if by reason of use, 
If we study, if we learn the truth and know the truth, we can use it to discern both good and evil. And it is a great tool for us to use, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the sword of the Spirit. So we started with the the girdle of truth, and now we move on to the breastplate of righteousness. The latter part of verse 14, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Let's first um, define the word righteousness. Four basic definitions that hint at the different shades of the meaning of the word. The quality of being right or just. The quality of being right or just. Whatever conforms to the revealed will of God, right action, and the sum total of God's revealed will. If you look in scripture, the word righteousness as it is used will have one of those four meanings usually. And so the quality of being right or just, and God is the one who defines right. He is the one who defines right and wrong. And so if I want to be righteous, I've got to go to God's word to do that. How is it that we obtain righteousness? We're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. It's faithful obedience that, we, that is required of us in order to have righteousness. Uh, we have to be faithful and obedient to the truth of God's word. John tells uh, his audience in 1 John 3 and verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he, Jesus, is righteous. So John was dealing with Gnosticism again, which John mentioned this morning. Gnosticism teaches that uh, uh, if you're a Christian, your actions don't really matter. You can do whatever you want and it doesn't matter because all flesh is evil is what they taught. Uh, But here John in combating that says, understand that you're not righteous if you don't practice righteousness which is God's will. And he says you have to do righteousness. At righteousness comes about from faithful obedience to the righteous word of God. We look to uh, Abraham. Abraham in Romans 4, verses 2 and 3, it says, If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, what is that a reference to? I think that's a reference to the time that God told Abraham to go and sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, God had told Abraham, through your son, whom I'm going to give you, there's going to be a great nation. Like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, your descendants are going to be. And so God or Abraham believed God. And when Abraham then goes to that mountain to sacrifice his son, not realizing this was just a test by God. Remember, they come to Mount Moriah and they say, he says to his servants, stay here with the donkey The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we, notice, we will come back to you. You understand, he believed God. He thought maybe God was going to have him kill his son, but if he did, he knew that God would bring him back. And that's what the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 17 and going through verse 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, Offered up Isaac. Now, I want to just stop real quick and remind you. By faith, he offered. Faith always is accompanied by obedience and action. And that's what we're talking about here. Abraham would not have been righteous if he had not gone to Mount Moriah to obey the command that God had given him. But he did obey. He offered Isaac. He was about to do it when God stopped him. So by faith, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, notice, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Why would you do that, Abraham? Well, the Hebrew writer tells us, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And so Abraham was willing to do that because he trusted God. And he was he was. Uh, at the point of plunging a knife into his son. I can't imagine that. 
how difficult that was, and God stopped him. But it was his faithful obedience to the word of God and his faith in God himself that gave him righteousness, that caused God to call him or name him as one who was righteous. Now, a breastplate on physical armor, it protects a, a man's heart, among other things, but righteousness protects our spiritual heart. If you look, if you would, at James 1, beginning in verse 22, and remember, righteousness or being righteous involves doing righteousness, and so James remind us, reminds us, be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and is not and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So righteousness helps to protect our spiritual hearts in the sense of as long as I continue to practice righteousness, um, I'm going to be blessed in what I do. But if I learn it but then don't do it, the chances are I'm, I'm going to fall away. I'm not going to be faithful. We're deceiving ourselves if we're hearers only of the word. So if I am righteous, if I'm doing what is right, obeying the will of God, it protects my heart spiritually and keeps me on the straight and narrow um, in a relationship that is pleasing with God. Jesus made the promise in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Um, happy are those who thirst for, hunger, uh, thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Um, righteousness is attainable. Um, we know that we're sinful people and we make mistakes, but righteousness is attainable through the grace of God. Uh, humble obedience to the teachings of God. Now we have the gospel of peace, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the, the armor over the feet, the boots, if you will, that are placed upon the soldier, Gospel, the word gospel, it means the good news. It means the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, I'm not going to take the time to read this whole passage to you, but here Paul says, I declared the gospel to you, and then he says, what I declared to you was the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so the good news is that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose again from the dead. Now notice... Why is it good news? Well, I think verse 15 sort of gives us one of the reasons it's such good news because the, the, the gospel is described as the gospel of peace. It's the gospel of peace. The, the word of God, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it makes peace possible between man and his God. It makes reconciliation possible, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so it's good news. Now, why is the gospel on the feet? Why is, did, is there a reason that it was the armor on the feet that is assigned to the gospel? And I think it's probably, not probably, definitely symbolic of the fact that God wants the gospel to go into all the world. You can't spell the word gospel without starting with the letters G-O or go. The gospel does no one any good if it does not go or travel into the world. And so hence the gospel being there on the feet. Isaiah 52 and verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now this passage is quoted in Romans chapter 10. In verses 14 and 15, Paul says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, here he quotes Isaiah, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And so the gospel is meant to go. 
You and I are the carriers of the gospel. This is one of the tools that we use in our battle against the devil. We try to spread the gospel. We try to make more Christians. And Jesus says in Mark 16 and verse 15, what we call the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Hence, the gospel of peace being on the feet of the soldier of God, because it is the feet that carry us into the world to spread the gospel. A lot of the problems of the church, a lot of the reasons that many of our congregations have become have shrunk and become small and, and are unable to do very much is because we haven't been using this tool. We haven't been going into the world and winning souls for Christ like we should. This, this gospel will help us to grow so that we can be stronger spiritually and stronger numerically in our work and labor for the Lord. Verse 16 mentions the shield of faith above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So the shield protects the soldier from the darts of the enemy. And now last week we talked about some of those tools that the devil uses, those uh, D words, the deception the devil uses, distraction from what is uh, most important, the dilution of God's word where he weakens it, uh, waters it down and uh, convinces people that they're okay being committed to a watered-down version of Christianity. Depression, or we could say discouragement, he uses. Both discouragement in our own failures and in the failures of others as well. And also division the devil uses. And so the shield of faith will help protect us from these darts of the devil and all the other darts that the devil might use against us. Um, Hebrews 11 and verse 6 tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he, uh, he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's one part of faith. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's the other part of faith. Not only believing in him, but trusting him. And um, we then, if we learn to trust in the Lord that he will reward us, it will help us to endure these darts of the devil that he casts at us and trying to discourage us. God is faithful, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, who will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God will make a way for us to escape these troubles, these trials that the devil casts at us. And as we think about the example of the Apostle Paul, we know that it was his faith in God, his faith that God was a rewarder of those who diligently seek him that helped him to remain faithful because, believe me, the devil threw a lot of darts at Paul. The devil wanted to stop Paul at all costs. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. You see, the devil, just like he did with Job, he took away Job's physical health, Paul's mentioning that his outward man is perishing. In other words, his physical body was growing old and, and, and he had sustained injuries and he had a thorn in the flesh. He had all these things physically. His body was perishing, but he says, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now Paul's afflictions, being stoned. Stoned and they thought he was dead and drug his body outside the city and left it by the side of the road like a piece of garbage. He calls that a light affliction. Why is it light? Well, he says it's but for a moment. It's temporary. And he says it is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, his faith and trust in God is what allowed him to endure these things. Because he understood that these things were temporary. And that God would not allow him to be tempted what he's able to bear. And that once these things were over, the reward that he was going to receive far exceeded the amount of sufferings that he had to do here on the earth. To be pleasing to our Father. And so he says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, For this, this reason I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. 
and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He knows whom he had believed in. He knew God. He trusted God and was persuaded that God was going to keep his word, that God was faithful. And that's why he was willing to suffer all that he did in service to the Lord. Moving on, he mentions the helmet of salvation in verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5 8 describes this helmet as the helmet of the hope of salvation. I think that is a little more precise. Um, Paul is writing to Christians in Ephesians 6, so um, we already have salvation. It's the hope of salvation that aids us uh, in our battle with the devil. As the helmet protects the head, so the hope of salvation, it protects our minds. It does that by motivating us, by keeping us focused. This, as we just talked about with Paul, this hope of heaven that we have uh, helps to keep us focused on what is really important, that which is eternal, not that which is seen. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, referring back to chapter 11 and all those great men and women of faith, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. Notice this hope that we have of salvation. It helps keep us focused on Jesus. And we lay aside the sin that so easily ensnares us and we run this race keeping our eye on the goal. That is Jesus and getting to him that we might have that reward for us. In Romans 8 and verse 24 and 25 Paul says we are saved in this hope. But hope which that is seen is not hope for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. He's talking about the hope of salvation. Now, we have salvation in a sense here. We can know that we're saved, but we don't have the reward yet. The, at least the full reward of, of, you know, heaven. But so we haven't uh, grasped that yet. But he says it's the hope, the desire and the, the strong desire and the expectation of one day having that, that will cause us to persevere uh, and stay faithful to the Lord. And then finally, we have the sword of the Spirit. And we can, and I have in the past done many sermons just on this aspect of the armor. Let us be clear, this, this isn't my sword, it's the sword of the Spirit. In John 16 and verse 13, Jesus promised his disciples, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. It's the Spirit that revealed the Word to the apostles. So it's His Word, okay? But He allows us to use that tool in our battle with the devil. That sword is alive or active. It is powerful. It is sharp. It's going to accomplish the task for which we set it to. Uh, in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul of the spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's nothing more aggravating than trying to cut something with a dull knife or to cut down a tree. I used to cut down trees and we used chainsaws and boy you had to keep those chainsaws sharp otherwise you just you couldn't do anything without it with if it was dull and so you have to, to keep the word sharp in, in the sense that we have to know the word so that we can be effective with the word and that we can impart that knowledge to other people. This sword will prick the heart of a person who has a tender heart, a person who is willing to hear and obey. Acts 2 and verse 37, those men on Pentecost, let me suggest to you that the ones who obeyed were a small percentage of the total who were there. But nevertheless, there were those there on Pentecost who had tender hearts because when they heard that they had crucified the Son of God, it says they were cut to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Some of those men there were moved to want to obey God. Why were they moved? Their hearts were pricked or cut there by the word of God. But that same sword also, it will cut the hard heart 
in Acts chapter 7, we have uh, Stephen speaking to the, the Jewish leadership. And it says, when they heard what he had said, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. And so there's the opposite effect on the hard heart. It pricks the tender heart and encourages obedience. And those who have hard and stubborn hearts, it cuts, it hurts. And they often lash out and attack the one uh, who delivers that. This sword that the, that the Spirit has given us to use, it can be used offensively um, in our service to God. Paul, in talking to Timothy, says that from a childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says a passage we know well, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we can use that word, the sword of the Spirit, in an offensive sense, going into the world, um, making the world a better place, so to speak. That sword equips us for every good work. But it can also be used in a defensive sense. It can be used to help us resist sin. Matthew 4 and verse 4, we have the example of Jesus when he was tempted. He quoted scripture to the devil. He says, it is written. And he does that each time the devil tempts him. And we're reminded of the words of the psalmist. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, Jesus knew the word of God, had already committed himself to obeying the word of God. So that when the temptation arose, he didn't have to stop and think about it what he was going to do, what his answer was going to be, he already knew, because it is written. Same for us. We commit that word to our heart, and we make the decision that uh, I'm not facing this temptation now, maybe, but someday I will be, and this is how I'm going to respond when that temptation comes. Whether it's sexual temptation, or a temptation with drugs and alcohol, or a temptation to tell a lie, be deceitful, whatever it might be, when that situation arises, I'm going to obey God and do His will as revealed in the Word of God. That's a defensive use of the sword of the Spirit. We can, we can parry those darts of the devil that he has cast at us and trying to tempt us to do wrong. And again... 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, passage we already have noticed, we can use the word of God to give an answer or give a defense to those who ask a reason of the hope that is in you. So that's, that's defensive use. We give a defense um, of, uh, of the truth and why we believe what we do. We need to make sure, though, that we're trained in the use of that sword. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, we're, be, we're to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing, it means rightly interpreting, rightly applying the word of truth. We, we have to practice with it. We have to study it and learn it in order to be able to use it effectively, just like a, a real sword. You put a real sword in someone's hand and they have no training, they're just as likely or more likely maybe to hurt themselves than anyone else. It takes proper training to use a sword and we need to train ourselves in the use of God's word. Because Peter mentions that there are some who twist the scriptures and use them to their own destruction. Notice 2 Peter 3, beginning of verse 14. Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles. Now we're talking about the word of God here. Speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand. Now notice, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. People who are not trained in the use of the scriptures can sometimes purposely, sometimes ignorantly, twist the scriptures and pervert the scriptures to their own destruction. So it takes effort on our part to be able to use the sword effectively. And in doing that, we will refrain from hurting ourselves or hurting others by using it improperly. Unfortunately, um, there are a lot of people who use the word of God, they pervert it, they twist it, and make it mean things that it never did. And in doing so, they're endangering their souls, but also the souls of those who hear them and believe. The armor of God. 
The devil has his tools, his means of affecting us, but God has not left us without the armor to stand against him. Are we going to use that armor? First of all, are you in the army of the Lord? Are you a member of his church, his people? If not, we offer you the invitation this morning to become a Christian. Uh, Enter into that army, if you will. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then act upon that faith and, and, obey, and obey so that you may become righteous. God can declare you righteous. You obey by repenting of your sins as Jesus commanded, by confessing your faith as Jesus commanded, and by being baptized as Jesus commanded, and then your sins can be washed away. Are you in the army of the Lord? We're about to sing a song, and if you're not, we offer you the opportunity to enlist uh, this morning and begin using that armor. For those of you who already are Christians, have, are you wearing that armor and are you using that armor in your battle against Satan? God has given you the tools for success, but maybe you, maybe you haven't been a good soldier in the service of the Lord. Maybe you've even allowed yourself to become unfaithful. That being the case... Maybe you've gone AWOL, so to speak. But God is always willing to bring you back and accept you back if you repent of the sins in your life and ask His forgiveness. So, whether you're someone who's never become a Christian, you can do that as we sing this song. If you're a Christian who's become unfaithful, please come back to the Lord. We encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at our price at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.